Okay, so what are my two variables? Here is a female undergrad. What two things do I need to know about her? There's two things I need to know about her. What's the first thing I need? What's one thing I need to know about her? How many sips she did? How many sips she did? Great. What's the other thing? Someone from this half. What's the other thing I need to know about her? The time period in which the steps were Um, that's always 90 seconds. What were they told? What were they told? So was she told, do your best? Or was she told, try to improve by 10%? So, does everyone understand that? So she's either going to be told, she's either going to be in the group that was told, do your best. And this group over here was told, try to improve by 10%. So, does everyone understand, did everybody get that out of this? Okay. And then we see how many SIPs they can do. How many SIPs they did. Which one of those is my independent variable. Which one of those did I mess with? What can, yeah, which one can I control? Can I control how many sit she did? Can I control what, what she was told? Yes. Yes, so what she was told is my independent variable. That's my independent variable. So that my dependent variable is number of sit-ups. How are you guys feeling about that? Everybody okay with this? Do you need 15 seconds to check in with your neighbors? No? You sure? Okay. All right. Confounding variable. Um, <coughs> then a senior. Okay? Okay. Can you read? Okay. Yeah. So confounding variable is a variable, not one, not one of the two that we're planning on, that has some effect as we change as we change our independent variable. It's also affected, and it changes, or it, or even independently, it changes our y variable. Um, so one main example is like um, taking a pill. If I give you a pill. You're not, you're not, oh, you know, you're not feeling well, oh, let me give you a pill. And you think that pill is going to make you feel better, so then you start feeling better, even though the pill is just a little sugar pill. That's kind of the thing, it's called the placebo effect, you guys probably heard of that, right? So just the fact, so that's the problem, is if we give somebody a drug, they'll improve just because they think they should, and then they'll improve because of the drug itself. So what we've, that's a confounding variable. What we've done is we've, I'll flip to the next page, is we've kind of adjusted for that by, because it's such a common thing, that we have a control group that just gets the placebo, the, the fake pill. So that way they both improve because they think they should, and then the difference should be because of the drug. Um, so that's, the placebo is one way that we sort of account for or remove the effects of, the, of that confounding variable. But often confounding variables, we don't even know what they are, or they're hard to remove and, and adjust for. Um, Clayton, B, go ahead and read. The finding is when the subjects don't know if they're getting the real drug or placebo. Right, which is really important. Yep, keep going. Double binding is when both the subjects and the researchers don't know who is getting the real drug or placebo. Which is also important because as a researcher, you might accidentally give some tell as you're talking or interacting with the subject that lets them know whether they're getting the real drug or the placebo, which would kind of screw everything up. And then keep going. Right, replication. So if I do an experiment and I get this great result, and oh wow, this drug really improves people's memory. 
if I can replicate it somewhere else, then that gives my experiment, that gives my, my findings a lot more weight. Because the first experiment might have just been a fluke. It might have just been lucky. I got an unusually good group of people who happen to have an unusually high memory, so it wasn't just the pill. They scored better than average just because they're already better, better than average. You don't know that you've gotten an unusual sample. And um, that happens kind of a lot, where people do an experiment, and then they get an unusual result and say, oh, wow, I found something unusual. You know, this thing really changes things, and they write a paper. And then people can't replicate it because it wasn't that, <coughs> that you know, whatever it is changes things. It's not, it's not that, it's not that um, taking, this, taking iron will um, you know, help you score better on tests. It's just in that, exam, in that one sample they had, they had an unusual sample and got those unusual res results. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a video. There is this thing called the, um, I think it's called the, I don't know what it's called, but it's called, the whole talk is called Why Most, Most Published Papers Are False. And, in a 2005 paper entitled Why Most Published Research is False. So recently, researchers in a number of fields have attempted to quantify the problem by replicating some prominent past results. The Reproducibility Project repeated 100 psychology studies, but found only 36% had a statistically significant result the second time around. And the strength of measured relationships were on average half those of the original studies. An attempted verification of 53 studies considered landmarks in the basic science of cancer only managed to reproduce six, even working closely with the original study's authors. These results are even worse than I just calculated. The reason for this is nicely illustrated by a 2015 study showing that eating a bar of chocolate every day can help you lose weight faster. In this case, the participants were randomly allocated to one of three treatment groups. One went on a low-carb diet, another went on the same low-carb diet plus a 1.5 ounce bar of chocolate per day, and the third group was the control, instructed just to maintain their regular eating habits. At the end of three weeks, the control group had neither lost nor gained weight, but both low-carb groups had lost an average of five pounds per person. The group that ate chocolate, however, lost weight 10% faster than the non-chocolate eaters. The finding was statistically significant with a p-value less than 0.05. As you might expect, this news spread like wildfire to the front page of Build, the most widely circulated daily newspaper in Europe, and then to the Daily Star, the Irish Examiner, the Huffington Post, and even Shape magazine. Unfortunately, the whole thing had been faked. Kind of. I mean, researchers did perform the experiment exactly as they described, but they intentionally designed it to increase the likelihood of false positives. The sample size was incredibly small, just five people per treatment group, and for each person, 18 different measurements were tracked, including weight, cholesterol, sodium, blood protein levels, sleep quality, well-being, and so on. So if weight loss didn't show a significant difference, there were plenty of other factors that might have. So the headline could have been chocolate lowers cholesterol, or increases sleep quality, or something. Right, so again, just another two things to take away from that. One is that, um, is that people who are biased and do a study will try to work things in their favor, right? So in this case, they took a really small sample. Remember we talked about last class how really small samples, it's really easy to get them to be different extremes because it's a small sample. Um, and then the other thing is um, that randomly you could just, they could have reproduced like 60 something percent of these psychology experiments and what happens is you do an experiment. You hope that something's going to happen and it does. You're like, yay, I got something unusual and you write a paper. It's not necessarily that that what you thought was true, so much as you might have just gotten an unusual sample. So if you get, if you're in that, so um, if you're, say you, you, you do something, um, oh, let me talk about this for a second, sorry. In, in statistics, we have a guideline for unusual. What we say is, if something is 5% or less likely to happen, then we consider it unusual. That's our general guideline, 5% or less. So what that means is 5% of the time, you will randomly get something unusual. 
Um, everybody, pull up your computers. Go ahead and pop those up, or or or, or you can share with a friend. That's fine. It's totally okay. Um, what I want you guys to do is Google Rossman Chance. So um, Rossman Chance applet. Rossman Chance applet. Can you guys see that okay? Rossman and then Chance. And then pick this one. Is everybody there yet? <clears throat> Rossman Chance, Applet, and then choose the one proportion inference. You can probably do it on your phone too. So try, try it on your phone. You guys should have, you guys should be on it somewhere. You can't put all of on, that's too many. Okay. I think I can do it on my phone. Rossman, <coughs> Chance, Applet, Alley, Applet. Okay, and then choose choose the one proportion inference. Oh, you can totally do it on your phone. Absolutely, can do it on your phone. All right, our probability of heads. What's probability of heads? We think it's 50%. Okay. We'll do an experiment to find out. Number of tosses, make that 100. And then where it says animate, click that off or it might take a really long time. And then draw your samples. So all of us are going to flip a coin 100 times. I got, see, where it says, see right here where it says heads right there where my cursor is moving? I got 56 heads. What did you guys get? Someone give me some numbers. What did you get? 56? What did you get? 52? 44. What did you guys get? 59. 56? Okay, so who got 59 or more? He did. These two people, these three, you, got, you, got, you guys did separately and you got 59 heads? Okay, so those three people would say, oh my gosh, 59 heads out of, out of 100, that's, statistic, that's a less than 5% chance of happening. The probability of getting heads must be bigger than 50%. So they write this paper that, wow, probability of getting heads is not 50% like we always thought, it's something larger. And then someone would try to reproduce it and they wouldn't be able to. Right? So it's not necessarily that, that there's more than 50% chance of heads, it's just that randomly you're going to get something unusual 5% of the time. Right? If you set the level as 5%, that means. 5% of, of your things you get are going to be considered unusual. And just by chance, that's going to happen 5% of the time. So the 95% of the time when you get something unusual, you don't write a paper. The 5% of people who do get an unusual sample and don't know they have an unusual sample will write a paper. And that's where this whole thing came in. Because you don't know. You've, you've spent $100,000 to do the study. You have no clue whether your sample is usual or unusual. You assume it's usual. It's, not, a, it's an, not an unusual sample. And the 5% time that, you, that people happen to get something unusual, they write a paper. How you guys feeling? Thumbs? Good? Medium? Not so much? Getting no answer from a lot of people? Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the, at the advantages of experimental studies. Um, Eva, go ahead. Um, can, can advantages of experimental studies can control exactly what subjects you want to study and how to place them in groups. Can not control and manipulate the independent variable as well? Right. So that's good. You have total control of experimental studies. There are some disadvantages. Um, unnatural settings, <coughs> right? It may not apply to real life. Um, or the Hawthorne effect when subjects act differently because they know they're being watched. Uh, these are important. Uses and misuses of, of statistics. Um, Bianca, B. Go ahead. Suspect samples of the sample are how the sample selected. 
volunteer community. Right. Was it a biased sample selection? Keep going. For the sample work for limited their population for clustering in people to do school. Right. And those, you know, did you did you take a good representative sample? Yes. Did you leave some some people else? Keep going. Some ambiguous averages. Mm -hmm. What particular measure of average was used and why? Mean, medium, mode, or mid range. Great. Thank you. So um, what do we think of when we say average? When we hear average, what's the first thing that comes to mind? The mean. Yeah, you add them all up and you divide by how many there are, right? And so one thinks of it, they hear the word average. But technically, that's just the mean, the most common average. Median, mode, and mid-range are also technically averages, measures of center. Um, median is also a very good one. Have you guys ever heard of median home price? Um, the median home price means that half the homes are less than that amount, half the homes are greater than that. It's the one exactly in the middle. That's the median. That's, that's, that's also a very, we call resilient um, measure of average. We'll talk about that more in chapter three. Mode is the one that occurs the most. And you guys have probably heard that one before too. The other one though is the mid-range. The mid-range is the, anything that's the mid is always the middle, so it's always going to be an average. The mid-range is the middle of the top and the bottom. So you take the smallest number and the largest number and you average those two. You take the middle of those. Here's the problem with it. Say there's a company, has 50 people, 50 employees. 49 of them make $20,000. One guy makes a million dollars. Technically, you can say the average employee, what's the average of a million and 20,000? A little over 500,000, right? Technically, you could say the average employee makes over a half a million dollars, right? And people assume you mean average like mean average instead of mid-range. So te technically, that's true, but it's, it's, it's quite misleading, right? Um, there was this commercial that came out, political commercial, obviously politics are full of ways of abusing statistics um, that said the average part employee makes it was like $120,000, something crazy like that, um, which people should obviously doubt because that seems ridiculous. Um, and I first thought, oh, he means the mid-range or he's doing something weird with average. Um, but as it turns out, what he was doing was he was counting. Who's ever gotten a paycheck? And you know, like, you think you're making X dollars an hour and you look at your paycheck and you are, but then they start subtracting all, all the stuff. All right, Social Security, Medicare, um, SDI, um, SDI um, disability insurance. So they're taking out like 9 or 10% out of your check for that. Your employer is matching. If you're an employer, you've also got to match that. You know, so you've got to put in 10% also or 9% also. Um, and then on top of that, you have this thing called workers' comp, which is when um, it's basically insurance in case your, your worker gets injured on the job. <laughs> So I had carts and malls selling, little, selling Beanie Babies in Italian Town Residence and malls in the Great Mall and, and in Sun Valley Mall and in Stormridge Mall too. And if you go in there, they're just sitting at, at a cart in the middle of the mall. But whatever I pay them, I have to pay an extra 30% insurance. So if I pay them $10 an hour, say for example, then I'd have to pay an extra $3 an hour to insurance for them in case they get injured while they're sitting there on a stool with the cart. Um, and then, uh, so what was going on was, what he was talking about was, he was counting all that amount in there and their health insurance costs. He was counting that in there as well. So that's not an average Barton employee makes. I, we don't get, you don't get that much money, you know, in your pocket. This is what, you know, maybe he, he, if he'd said what the average Barton employee costs, mm -hmm. then that would be accurate, right? But politicians are always going to just do things like that. Anyway. Not all of them are bad, but that guy was bad. And he was a Democrat. Just as terrible. I mean, even when he won, I didn't vote for him because I can't believe he, missed, he abused statistics like that. That was awful. Awful, awful, awful. All right. Um, here are some more things. Um, Stephen G., go ahead. Changing the subject, not really a disease, but not even a condition of body. Oh, you know what? I should probably do this one. My bad. Um, yeah. So. This one isn't actually a misuse. It's just how can you tailor the words 
to play upon the feelings of your audience, which is not a misuse. It's just a persuasive argument, one might say, I suppose. Um, there was this commercial a few years ago about autism, and, and they said, or you know, somewhere they said, one out of 68 children will get, will have autism. If you're a parent, that scared the crap out of you. One out of 68, that sounds like a lot, right? If they said one, one and a half percent of children will get autism, does that sound as scary? One and a half percent does not sound as scary. One out of 68 is just under one and a half percent. But for whatever reason, it sounds a lot scarier, one out, of, one out of 68, which is why I remember that. I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, wait, that's only one and a half percent. But that's a, whole, that's a perfect example of this whole how you frame it, how you frame your numbers um, to cater to your audience. Um, another one is de detached statistics. One third fewer calories. Then what? A chocolate cake? They don't, they don't say, right? Um, sometimes they do, but if they don't, then it's really hard to say. Um, implied connections. Some um, studies suggest that some people may understand what the statement means. In most cases, might help reduce. Might, right? So eating a bar of chocolate every day may help you lose weight. Because out of 50 people, one person who ate a bar of chocolate a day lost weight. The other 49 gained 10 pounds, but that one person <laughs> lost weight. Right? So it may help you lose weight. It's, it's really, you know, those are all words that are non-binding words, right? You can't get kind of screwed into like, it's, they're non-factual, they're non, you know, you can't, you can't hold them to anything on that. So, just be careful of words like that. Misleading graphs, we'll talk more about that next uh, chapter. Um, or loaded questions. Do you guys feel that statistics teachers should be paid higher, higher salaries? What do you guys think? We work hard, right? Yes. Would you support increasing students' tuition or pay statistics instructors more money? Mm -hmm. No. Right. So it kind of depends on how you load the question, right? How you phrase it. Um, so yes, uh, definitely asking kind of the same thing, but with different <coughs> phrasing, with different connections. Um, Let's get uh, Vanessa C. Go ahead and read. Questions are unintentionally loaded by such factors as the order of the items being considered. Would you say traffic contributes more or less to air population than industry? Perfect. Thank you. So when they asked that, 45% traffic said traffic, 27% said industry. When they flip those two words, would you say that industry con contributes more or less to air pollution than traffic? They got the exact, almost the exact opposite kind of results, just by which one was listed first and last. Um, and there's really no way, I mean, you gotta list one first and one last, right? you gotta phrase it somehow. So um, the only way you can maybe try to mitigate for this and what people usually do is they do half one way and half the other way and then they kind of average the results. Common pitfalls, ah, this is a really good one. Um, Steven, G, you didn't really read the other one, so go ahead and read this one. <coughs> Concluding that one variable causes the other variable when in fact that a variable that only causes the other associated together. Two variables that may seem linked are smoking and post rate. We cannot conclude the one causes the other correlation to be by a casual casualty. Ca causality. Right, so this is a really big one. See how it's in red? Anything in red is usually fairly important. Um, this one's important. Um, so, what we're saying is, if you are just doing an observation, hands off, you are not getting involved in changing things, not an experiment, you're just observing things, then you can say that smoking, people who smoke tend to have a higher heart rate. You can't say that smoking causes a higher heart rate, because all you can say is that they're correlated, they're related. If you don't do an experiment, you can't conclude that correlation, that things are, that, that go together, are related. We can't say that one causes the other one. You don't know which causes which. You don't know that smoking causes a higher heart rate. Maybe people who happen to have a higher heart rate happen to be more nervous or more stressed out, and so because of that, they tend to smoke more. 
Maybe you know it goes the other way around. You, you, you don't know. Um, it's what you know. It's uh, a, it's the biggest pitfall. Again, remember we talked about that last, last class. If you're only observing, you can only say the two things are related. You can't say that one causes the other one. You don't know which which causes which. The only way that you could possibly determine that one causes the other one it would be for me to say, okay, you guys have to smoke a pack a day. You guys not allowed to smoke at all. And then see if your average heart rate is higher than theirs. You know what I mean? See if that would be unethical. Because to force people to smoke a pack a day would be bad. Right? Um, but that's the only way that you can say something causes the other one is if you do an experiment and put people into one group or the other and then see how they do. If you're just observing, you can't do that. That will absolutely be on the, on the exam. Something where we ask you a question and you know you have to you have to conclude well you have to recognize from a problem or an experiment that that can't be drawn that that thought that that causality can't be drawn um, real quick we're going to do one more thing data collected in original form is called raw data here's an example of raw data for the number of siblings people have you know what is it getting warm in here yeah. Um, everybody turn off your computers. Sorry, I know I said you turn them on, but we're done with them for the day. So you can turn them off the normal way or you can just hold that button underneath for a couple seconds. I think it's on the other side, on the bottom right side. But they'll, it'll, they'll cool off in like an hour the whole thing will be cool. Okay, so think hard about how many siblings you have that you grew up with, you know, kind of in your household. Okay. Uh, we're just going to kind of go through, we're going to go straight across the front row and then back along here and back through. Okay, ready? Go. Zero. Zero. Next. Zero. Next. Two. Next. Three. Next. Over there. How many? Seven. Next. Eight. Eight. Next. Six. Next. Three. Three. Next. Seven. Zero. Next. Two. Wait, sorry. Two. 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 Next. Three. Next. One. Next. Two. raw form. All right, this is just your data, raw form. Is it easy to explain or understand or see this data from here? No. So again, we put it into table form, which we'll talk about after break. We'll take a break, uh, 10 minutes, so we'll come back at 13, 23 after.